Assalamu alaikum. Thank you to everyone joining us online and here in person today. All questions will be fielded from the website where you can post a question, sheikharif.com slash live. As Sheikh Arif begins the lecture today, can we please recite a salawat? أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين شفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين وأصحابه المنتجبين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى قيام يوم الدين ولعنة الله الدائمة على عدائهم أجمعين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. We did not manage to finish yesterday what we had started, and we said we will finish it off today. So we spoke of communicating with the Imam in his occultation, the major occultation, and the sense in all of those texts and the way that they have created our ceremonies and the places in which we visit him, we stated that if we were to subject 
these traditions to the hadith scrutiny that takes place in the process of verifying the hadith literature within the jurisprudential issues, then none of these are hadith can be proven to be accurate. We say that instead we will take a different approach. We would much rather look at the content of the hadith unless it is absurdly inaccurate, we will try and reason with it and try and make sense. In that process, we stated that yes, maybe some things are valid, some things are not, but we cannot take them as parts of religion. We can do them as practices that we ourselves want to commit ourselves to in our adoration and love of our blessed Imam. But we cannot attribute them to religion and there's a huge distinction between this attribution of something to religion and it being a personal gesture of devotion. On the one hand, it forms the notion of religion to the outsider, that this is their religion. On the other hand, no, this is nothing to do with religion, this is just their practices. So it takes religion, it takes it all out of religion. Now, we stated, now, Ariza do not have any place within religion in the sense that we can have verifiable texts. Now to go through this a little bit today, yet the Arizas are responded to. Jamkaran has no valid place in religion, yet people get cured, find answers at Jamkaran. So what does that say then? Does that mean that they are parts of religion and that they have been verified by our Imams or is there something else going on and is there any other explanation? Now, if we just look at the Ariza issue, as I said, we will not be concerned with the scrutiny of the chain of Hadith. We have in Al-Atiq Al-Gharawi, the Hadith from Imam Baqir, in which he says to his companion, he says, and when you are in difficulties or you have a need from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then in that case, write your need to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fast on a Thursday, come out on the morning of Friday. When you write your need to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on a piece of paper, then close the piece of paper and then throw it inside the sea. Stand in a way that you are facing the Qibla. And then say Bismillah rahman rahim and do salawat on the Prophet and his family and then pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now this was a method of Ariza taught by the fifth Imam which was purely God-centric. Then we have a report from, I believe, the second Naib of the Imam, the twelfth Imam, in which he said that a letter came to the eleventh Imam and the eleventh Imam read the letter in which it said that I am in a lot of difficulty. The eleventh Imam replied to him, he said, Allah is testing you. Be patient. However, if you wish, you may write your troubles to Allah on a piece of paper. Take it to the shrine of Imam Hussein, raise that piece of paper and say, plead with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then put it in a place that nobody knows where it is. In both of these hadiths, we are seeing a very God-centric practice within Ariza itself. Then we get two hadiths, two ahadith from Imam Sadiq Salamullah Alay in Misbah al kafami Now, in these ones, the Imam Sadiq says that write the Ariza, throw it in running water or throw it inside a well. However, Imam Sadiq says, write the name of the Prophet, Imam Ali, Al Hassan, Al Hussein, and the rest of the Imams. Now, here is problem that if the Imam's names were known at the time of Imam Sadiq then why was there so much confusion in the period of Hayra, the period of confusion from the occult, period of occultation till 100 years? If the names were known of the Qaim and Mahdi, then why did Jafar, the uncle of Mahdi, claim Imama? And why did the first Naib go, who was also the Sahabi of the 11th Imam, the first Naib? who was the, uh, also the naib of the 11th Imam. Why did he go and congratulate the 11th Imam? So we can see that, okay, this, his, this hadith, even if we do not subject it to the hadith scrutiny of verifying the authoritative hadith or not, the content itself 
is suspect. The second hadith of Prophet is related to Imam Sadiq is the same. It is asking from Allah, but it mentions the names of the 12 Imams. And then in the Dua'i Tawassul fashion, there is a Dua, Inni astashfi'u bikum. But we know that that theme wasn't there in the time of Imam Sadiq. The Dua'i Tawassul, the style of it, comes much later after the occultation of the Imam. So we know that we cannot use actually those two hadith. So even though we do not subject them to the scrutiny of the chain, the theme in itself is so not in sync with what was happening at that point that we cannot at all take them even at a point of consideration. So now comes the hadith that is narrated in uh, Biharul Anwar, in which Majlisi says, the Ariza that we have at present, now that is not God-centric at all. This Ariza is addressed to the 12th Imam directly. Then after addressing the 12th Imam, he says, now write your hajat here. And then there's a prayer again being made to the 12th Imam or to Allah for the 12th Imam. But the hajah is being asked of the 12th Imam. Then Majlis says, says <coughs> that call, that uh, fold it up, put it in such and such a substance. And before you're going to throw it inside the sea, call upon any one of the four Nawab either the first or his son the second or Husn ibn Ruh third one or Abu hassan Muhammad ibn Ali uh, summary the fourth one call any one of those four and say to them that you are gates and doors to the twelfth Imam and I believe that you will communicate with the twelfth Imam after your death as you did so in your lifetime now this Ariza is totally alien to everything that theology has taught us it is not God-centric, it is not addressed to God, it is addressed to the Imam. And then the messenger are four, one of four people who have all passed on. And there is no text saying that these people are intermediaries between an Imam who is in major occultation by assumption in their time of death. So we can see it's totally suspicious and it doesn't work. It's totally inconsistent and it is very unproductive in that way because it distracts the minds from God's centricity and brings it into a fold of its Imam centricity. The whole religion then becomes based on the Imam and the authority of the Imam and Imam's ability to see in his occultation and dead people, I mean the Nawabul Arba are not like the Imams. When we say that the Imam dies, fine, their life is so brilliant that their death cannot harm their life. But anybody less than the Imam, we cannot say that about them, not at all. It is theologically suspect, fully suspect. In fact, if you look at the uh, Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I will gather the prophets and I'll ask the prophets, Mada ujiptum, what was the response? And they said, we don't know. After we left them, we don't know what they did. Even Isa is saying, I don't know what they did. And about the Isa, we believe that Isa, salamu alayhi, was not crucified. Although according to the hadith of the 8th Imam, Isa tasted death. As he was being taken to the heavens, he tasted death. But in any case, if you look at the Ariza one, the one that we are using and that is addressed specifically to Hussein ibn Ruh, that can in no way be admitted to be valid. In addition to that, it is counterproductive. Now you may ask, well what about the question of people seeing signs in Jamkaran, Masjid Sahla? I will say yes, this thing needs attention from us. Now, there is a place in Ireland where they miraculously saw a brilliant light shining on a wall and that was thought to be the, the light of Mother Mary. People who witnessed that light experienced miraculous cures in their body and even now People go there to get cured, and many people swear by it. Think about this carefully. Does that mean, therefore, that Mary alayha, is alive? And does that mean, therefore, that the religion of Christianity is the true one? Then we have stigmata. We have the faithful. Their palms of their hands start to bleed at Easter. We cannot verify that Isa was crucified. Ma sallabuhu wa ma qataluhu yaqeena. 
the Quran is saying neither did they crucify him neither did they kill him and even they do not have surety of it well Rafa'ullah rather Allah raised him so Isa has not been crucified how does the blood come out from the palms of their hands and if that is valid then that means Isa was crucified and Quran is wrong and that means Consequently, every other theology based on Isa's crucifixion has also been deemed has also to, uh, to, to be deemed as valid that he has died as a penance for our sins. We will not admit to any of that. If that is the case in other faiths, then why can we not, therefore, subject our faith to similar skepticism? That yes, these signs are happening, but these signs have got nothing to do with the factuality of the claims made that this belongs to the 12th Imam, this place. Can you see that? These things are happening. We have to find this uh, responses and answers somewhere else. But not that this thing can then verify that the 12th Imam has appointed that place for himself. When he himself is saying that anybody who says that he has seen me before the Sayha, the cry in the heavens, or before the coming of the uh, Sufyani, or before my coming out, don't believe them. So if anybody says, I've seen the 12th Imam, immediately we are to be suspicious of that person that according to the text of the 12th Imam, you're not supposed to say this. And if you're saying this, then you're not maybe a very reasonable believer, a very good believer. So now, how do these things happen if there's no validity to them in terms of their authenticity of that place? How do these miraculous things happen? We used to go to Bibi Zainab Salamullah's shrine. None of us know if Bibi Zainab is buried there. Yet in Arbaeen, things used to happen. People used to get cured and find cure. You see, we do not know exactly what is happening in this world of God, but many, many things are happening. Sometimes we induce such spirituality in a place that that place acquires potency and it does things but that potency is a result of our genuine devotions our emotional input our yearning of god so on and so forth this brings about that spiritual potency and that then helps us imam ali has said your cure is from you yourself now i want to ask a question listen to this carefully if Jamkaran has so much potency, then why doesn't the Kaaba have it? Is the Kaaba more superior to Jamkaran or not? Okay, fine. Leave the Kaaba aside. There are 70 messengers or prophets buried there. What about the shrine of the Prophet? Isn't that greater than anything we can ever imagine? So why don't such miracles take place at the shrine of the Prophet or are not so prominent? You will have to concede that these things have to be attributed to some other force. So now there's one more theory and I want to touch on that and then go on to today's lecture and commence it at least. The other theory is this, that our Sufis and the Orafa talk of the mystical realm. You find this in the works of Ibn Arabi, his commentator Qaisari, in which they talk about the hierarchies of the Sufi. That in the Sufi hierarchy, there is a pole. There is a Sahabul Yameen, a Sahabul Yasar, the person of the right, person of the left, the four Aimma, and then the seven, and then the twelve, and then the hundred, the three hundred and sixty, so on and so forth. And these are the people who are in charge of the affairs of this world, and they are regulating the world, and they are a good force, and they are mending things inside this world. Nobody can say that this is far-fetched because the Quran talks about the realm of Khidr, that Khidr is operating in his own realm. What I'm trying to say here is that yes, maybe, maybe the Imam is existing in that realm. The difference is that until and unless we know with surety, we cannot commit ourselves to it. We can at most speculate and we can say yes, these things are there. The Quran does not deny them. The Sufis live by them. 
they have this realm and they meet with each other and they say there is this realm and the awtad or the axis is right. And so Ibn Arabi says, I saw the Mahdi. But then in another place, Ibn Arabi claims himself to be the Mahdi of the time, the lesser Mahdi. So whoever Ibn Arabi saw as the Mahdi cannot be admitted to as being the Mahdi of this worldly existence. So in accordance with that, every sign and every visitation attributed to Imam Mahdi has to be taken as a personal sign of the individual that pertains to the individual for the individual's assurance and it does not constitute evidence in any way whatsoever. And therefore, anything conveyed by that person of Mahdi to that individual cannot be admitted within faith as a part of faith. That's clear cut. Because the text says, if anybody says that they've seen me, it is to be taken as inaccurate. Now, I will just finish this with that point, that if the conceptual Mahdi is all about progression, growth, confidence, then we will see that many of these cultures of Ariza that are no longer being written to God, but are written to Imam, are taking us away from this notion of growth and progression. Instead of liberating us and filling us with confidence, they are ridding our soul of confidence altogether. And then, if the original Ariza was to be written to God, then you can write to God or pray to God. It's the same thing. I am writing a letter to God, well, I can talk with Him directly. But I suppose if a person writes to God and goes to a shrine, then maybe the intensity of the prayer is deeper in that way because of that symbolism. Maybe it is something to do with human psychology because when we pray to God all the time, we are unaware of God and we are praying. But when we write a letter to God, we think, yes, God is going to receive this letter. Do you understand? It's a psychological thing. And therefore, we have more assurance and more confidence that this letter is going to be read by God. I'm just saying things like this. So the Ariza that is written with a God-centric attitude might work. But Ariza in itself might be counterproductive in the long term because people are supposed to evolve to a notion of having confidence with God that they read the verse of the Quran call me I will respond to you I am very very close I will respond to the one who calls me you will ask me then that what about then Imam Bakir saying then throw this Ariza inside the in facing the Qibla and make a prayer well maybe there is a Sufi form of Khidri hierarchy Maybe those creatures are looking. I'm not trying to encourage Arizas in any way whatsoever. I'm just trying to give a twist to it that will justify it in one way or another because I do believe religion is very broad. It is not as narrow as the people who say that we need to stick to the literal word of the authentic word, nor as broad as those who allow for every form of symbolism. There is a moderate path. Now we come to a very crucial part of our discussion. And this will carry on for the next few days. The authority structures that are created around Al-Mahdi. And then the charge that goes against Al-Mahdi that he is changing the religion. What do we want to establish here? What we want to say here is that first and foremost, is there a connection between Mahdi in the major occultation and the world? Two, can we prove that connection through text? Three, what level of connection is there? We are going to explore this. The level of connection through the transmitters who convey his word. Level of connection through the interpreters who interpret his word. Level of connection through authority structures who stand in his place and govern the people. And then we will ask a question that is it at all possible that they were valid at the time in which they were given? And at this point in time, the form that was, that was there initially may now have become outdated and in line with the conceptual Mahdism, they need to grow. And if we retain the form that was originally envisaged, it might run contrary to Mahdism altogether. So now here we have a Hadith of the Prophet. And I said, we are not going to subject the Hadith to the scrutiny. So the Prophet is being asked, 
عن كيفية الانتفاع بالإمام المهدي The Prophet is being asked Well how do we benefit from al-Mahdi fi ghaybatihi in his ghaybah and he's saying by Allah the one who has sent me as a prophet you will seek light from his light and benefit through his wilaya in his absence as the people benefit from the sun when the sun is covered behind the clouds now here comes the first thing that if the word ghayba was used, then why were the people so perplexed in the Asrul Hayra, in the era of confusion for a hundred years, commencing from the occultation? Why were people saying there is no Imam? Why wasn't this hadith being told to them that look, the Prophet has already spoken about ghayba? Can you see that? There was no notion of ghayba in the minds of the people at the time of the minor occultation and onwards. Now, if you look at the full text of the hadith, the full text of the hadith says that Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari, he says to the Prophet, he says, Ya Rasulullah, what do you say about yourself and who comes after you? So the Prophet says, that I am your prophet and after me, O Jabir, are the Imams of the Muslims. The first is Ali, the second is Hassan, then Hussein, then Ali ibn Hussein, then Muhammad ibn Ali, who in Torah is known as Baqir. And you will come to him and you will see his time. So give him my salam. That's the famous hadith we hear, right? Then after him will come with Sadiq ibn Muhammad, then Musa ibn Jafar, then Ali ibn Musa, then Muhammad ibn Ali, then Ali ibn Muhammad, then Hassan ibn Ali, then the one will come whose name is my name and whose kunniya is my kunniya, and he is the hujjat of Allah upon the earth, and Allah will keep him alive, and he's the son of uh, Ibn Hassan ibn Ali, Hassan of Hassan ibn Ali. Now, look at this hadith carefully. If the names of these imams were told to Jabir by the Prophet Muhammad and if everybody knew the names then why was there a dispute as to who is the Imam after the martyrdom of Imam Hussein? Why is there a dispute into who is the, as to who is the Imam after the Shahada or the Wafat of Imam Zainul Abidin? There is no dispute in the time of Imam Sadiq. Why is there a dispute as to who is the Imam after Imam Sadiq? Think about it. Zurara bin Ayyun, the Sahabi and the narrator, and Bukair, his brother, from the fifth and the sixth Imam. Zurara did not know who was the Imam after Imam Sadiq. He sent his son to Imam Sadiq or Sahabi, no, he was son, to ask him, Who is the Imam after you? Zurara died without knowing who was the Imam after Imam Sadiq because the messenger didn't get back. Then we have this hadith that Imam Sadiq said we were assuming Ismail to be the Imam. But there was a change in the course of destiny. And now Allah has chosen Musa as the Imam. Now if this hadith was accurate, I'm just talking about not the verification of the hadith from the chain, but from the way of its own content. If this hadith was valid, why such skepticism about who is the Imam? Why would Jafar even step up? Jafar is the uncle of the 12th Imam, the brother of the 11th Imam. Why would he contend his Ahlul Bayt? Yes, he is part of the family of the Prophet. He should have known the hadith, even if you say that others did not know the hadith. In one of the Tawqiyat, as we will read, the 12th Imam writes that even though the people of my family are disputing, because he is aware that the people of his family are saying that there is no 12th Imam and Jafar is saying, I am the Imam. If nobody else knew this hadith, at least Jafar should have known this hadith and not made a false claim that he was the Imam. So we cannot admit to such a hadith. Then we get the same hadith from Imam Sadiq. He said, after he was asked as to how will people benefit from Hujjah al ghaib al-Mastur, the Hujjah who is Ghaib and Mastur, first and foremost, somebody should take, check whether these notions were concurrent with Imam Sadiq the notion of Al-Hujjah. 
Al-Mastur, Ghaib fine, but Al-Mastur, the word Mastur comes before him in the text of Imam Ali. But in this context, Al-Hujjah, Al-Ghaib, Al-Mastur, in any case, Imam Sadiq replies, Kama yantafi'una bi shams ida sataraha as sihab. As people benefit from the sun when the clouds cover it. So we can say, okay, we are taking this hadith off. Imam Sadiq, fine. Now we go on. We come to the tawqiat. What are tawqiat? Tawqiat are the questions placed to the 12th Imam in his minor occultation through the mediation of one of the four emissaries. Yeah? The one who served the most was the second naib for 42 years. Uh, Muhammad ibn Uthman al-Amri. And the one after him was uh, Abu Qasim, uh, Hussein ibn Ruh, uh, Nawabakhti. He served for 16 years. So these are the two main ones. So Tawqiyat are the responses that the 12th Imam gives through his emissaries. So here, the question is that there... So Ishaq bin Yaqub gets this response from Muhammad ibn Uthman, the second naib. أَمَّا وَجْهُ الْإِنْتِفَاعَ بِي فِي غَيْبَتِي فَقَلْ إِنْتِفَاعَ بِشَمْسْ إِذَا غَيَّبَهَا عَنِ الْأَبْسَارَ السَّحَابِ The 12th Imam is saying, the way in which you benefit from me in my absence is the way in which you benefit from the sun when the clouds have covered the sun. Now here we ask a question. Well, how are we benefiting from the 12th Imam? Are we benefiting from his spiritual existence? In which case, fine, we go back to those theories that he is the grace of God upon the earth. And earth of God will not be devoid of his grace. Or that he is the mediator of the light of God upon the humanity on earth. And due to him, earth and heaven stand in place, if that is a valid notion. The other is, are we benefiting from his physical presence? If we say that we are benefiting from his physical presence, then that means that his physical presence has to be in the form of a guide or in the form of guidance so there are two possibilities you will benefit from me as the earth benefits from the sun when it is covered by the clouds if it's a spiritual benefit nobody has a problem the imam can be in disappearance and we are benefiting from him that's perfectly fine as our bohra brothers say but it is only when we say that no we are benefiting from his guidance that we can then talk of authority structures. So here, the school will claim that we are benefiting from his guidance in his absence through the mediation of somebody. And then that allows us to create authority structures. So now, in the, this then gives authority to other than the Imam in the capacity of being narrators of the word of the Imams. Now, I'm not going to quote the verse of the Qur'an, but we have, we have a hadith from 5th, 6th, 8th imams that when you can't reach us, refer to such and such. If you can't find us, refer to such and such. Or people come to the imam and say, if we can't see you, can we go to Yunus? The imam says, that's fine, go to him. He's a thika, he's a trustworthy person. He will narrate to you whatever I'm saying to him. Now, now, we want to ask this question more thoroughly. Can we pin this? Look at this. There is a report that is again from the Tawqiyah, received from again the second Naib, when the questions were asked. In which Imam Zaman says, وَأَمَّا الْحَوَادِثِ الْوَاقِعَ فَرْجَعُوا فِيهَا إِلَى رُوَاتِ حَدِيثِنَا In the events that will happen, make reference to those who narrate our hadith فَإِنَّهُمْ حُجَّةِ عَلَيْكُمْ وَأَنَا حُجَّةُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِمْ For they are, your author they are my authorities upon you and I am an authority of Allah upon them. Can you see this? Okay. So, so far, authority has been given to the reporters of hadith in the events that are to transpire. Within the major occultation or minor occultation, we don't know. Let's say in both. Now look at this hadith that is often being quoted 
from Imam Sadiq Salamulale concerning a faqih. This is famously phrased as Aradu Alayhim Karadu Alayna. Anybody who disputes their authority is disputing our authority. Waradu Alayna Huwarad Allah. And disputing our authority is disputing the authority of God. And this is a form of association with Allah. Now that is very, very heavy. Can you see that? That if you dispute with the authority of the faqih, you are disputing with my authority. Disputation with, uh, disputing with my authority is disputing with Allah's authority. But this gives this notion that the mujtahid in the present day, although I want to build up to it, has got that authority that cannot be disputed. Because disputing with his authority is disputing with the authority of Imam, which is disputing with the authority of Allah, and that is tantamount to shirk. If you look at the whole of this hadith, in which this caption is found, the question is asked, is in the Maqbula Umar ibn Hanzala. Maqbula means we've accepted this, this hadith, so Umar ibn Hanzala, in which he goes to the Imam and talks about disputation, disputes of two people. The Imam says, when you guys dispute and you can't come to me, find somebody that you are both pleased with who knows my hadith. Refer the case to him. When you refer the case to him, and then he passes judgment and adjudicates, then whoever rejects that adjudication is rejecting me. And whoever is rejecting me is rejecting God. And whoever rejects God is doing shirk with God. This hadith is merely giving authority to the level of a transmitter transmitting the rule on behalf of the Imam based on the words of the Imam. It is not giving authority to the mujtahid in the capacity of a mujtahid who is doing ijtihad. We are not saying that that is ruled out, but we are saying so far as this particular hadith is concerned, and the tawqi of Sahib zaman is concerned, that hawadith ul when those events will unfold, then look at rawat of hadith. This is giving them authority in the capacity of transmitters of hadith and nothing else. It is not giving the sort of authority that is supposed that, that, that we are trying to derive. So these are now the transmitters who are given this authority to adjudicate in accordance with the clear-cut instructions of the Imam. And therefore, when they pass a judgment, they are not passing a judgment, they are merely conveying the judgment of the Imam. From here then, we have the authority of the mujtahid. In terms of the authority of the mujtahid, we have to first justify the process of ijtihad. Because a mujtahid is not a transmitter of the hadith. Mujtahid is an interpreter of the Sharia law. There is a huge difference between a transmitter who, at, who verbatim transmits and a person who is trying to understand that what does this Sharia evidence say? And how can it be applied to this situation that was alien to anything that the Prophet and the Imams faced? It's a huge difference. So now we are talking about the authority of a mujtahid in the capacity of an interpreter of the Sharia. What are the evidences? So immediately we will say that the authority given to the transmitters can be stretched to give authority to the interpreter. Because Imam obviously knows that the Hawadith will atiyah, that those things that will come in years to come will not be clear cut and the mujtahid will need to interpret the hadith. And of course, Imam Sadiq Salamullah had already said that our job is to give you the principles and it's your job to ramify them. But in accordance to more specific evidences, we have the verse of the Quran. فَلَوْلَا نَفَرَ مِنْ كُلِّ فِرْقَةٍ مِنْهُمْ تَعِفَ لِيَتَفَقَّهُ فِي الدِّينِ وَلِيُنذِرُ قَوْمُهُمْ إِذَا رَجَعُوا إِلَيْهِمْ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَحْضَرُونَ O oh Muhammad, they cannot all come to you to learn the deen. Why does there not few people come to you from every group and they learn the religion? And when they go back, they warn their people so that their people may take caution. Sayyid al-Khui, in his Bahth al-Kharij, in the Babul Ishtihad and Taqlid, he says that this particular verse, nonetheless, 
talks about a very rudimentary level of ijtihad and its permissibility, and that that ijtihad was happening in the time of the Prophet. And we will have to concede that, yes, this verse is, when we analyze it properly, talking about a level of ijtihad that was occurring in the time of the Prophet, and that was valid. Fine. Then we have the hadith of the 11th Imam. فَأَمَّا مَنْ كَانَ مِنَ الْفُقَهَا سَائِنًا لِنَفْسِ حَافِظًا لَدِينِ مُخَالِفًا عَلَى هَوَا مُتِعًا لَأَمْرِ مَوْلَى فَلِلْعَوَامْ أَنْ يُقَلِّدُوا Whoever from amongst the fuqaha, so the notion of fuqaha is there, is safeguarding his soul, protecting his religion, acts contrary to his base desires, is obedient to the authority of his master, i.e. the imam, then the awam should follow that sort of a faqih. And we already had the notion of taqlid from the time of Bakir and Sadiq to hang the yoke of responsibility in the neck of another. So now here, we say that yes, taqlid is something that is ordained. And therefore the authority of the mujtahid in the absence of the 12th Imam seems to be something very valid. We cannot deny. The text of the Imam, the ayah of the Quran, the occultation, فَرْجَعُوا إِلَىٰ رُوَاتِ الْحَدِيثِ مَنْ كَانَ مِنَ الْفُقَهَا سَعِنَ الْنَفْسِ All of these give authority to the faqih. If we leave the text aside and look at it rationally, we will say, we want to understand our religion and how we ought to be doing things. We don't know who, what should we do. The rational argument is say, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكَرِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ لَتَعَلَمُونَ Ask those who know if you don't know. It's a rational principle. So the authority of the mujtahid is definitely there. Now, I ask this question and we will con command and continue with it tomorrow and go through the other authority structures. Was the Imam ordaining and giving authority to a particular process and to particular people? Or was the Imam granting authority to accuracy of understanding the pleasure of God? Let me give an example. There is a time in which all meat is the meat of swine. So at that point somebody can say, Swine is haram to consume. Or they can equally say, meat is haram to consume. Because every extension of meat is pork. Are you seeing that? Yes? Now, after a century, there are more products of meat sourced from other animals other than the pig. At this point now, to say meat is haram is false by rooting it into the initial statement that the Imam said meat is haram. We can ask the question, when Imam said meat is haram, only pig meat was available. What he meant to say was that pork is haram, not meat is haram per se. So if you can have other products of meat other than swine, then meat is not haram, pork is haram. Can you see this? So when the Imam says that this man is an authority, or his interpretive process is authority. Is the Imam giving authority to a particular individual or to a particular process of interpretation? Or is the Imam giving authority to accuracy of understanding the want of God in line with what is befitting in every context? Because when the Imam says, Unduru ila ruwati hadithina, at that point only those people were available. And the hadith applied at its face value level. And the interpretive process, which was to establish the ijtihadi process, is to try and establish what the text means in his literal capacity, was valid because everything was in the same context. Now the context has changed. So now when Allah says, ثُمَّ أَتِمُ siyam إِلَى layl complete the siyam till night and you go to Norwegian regions where night is half an hour does it really mean night as darkness just because those guys understood it 
that night means darkness. Does night really mean darkness? So is the interpretive method that was prevalent in the day being ordained as authority? Or is the accuracy of interpretation being ordained as authority? I want to finish here. If we were to say that yes, it was authority back in the day when the context was the same, Ruwatul Hadith will give the same Hadith that applies everywhere. Like in the book of Suduq, Saduq, Man la yadurul faqih, he just brings Hadiths and not Fatwas. He says, problem of Najasa here, problem of Wudu here. He just brings Hadith and Hadith are giving the answers. This is Rawiul Hadith giving the answer from direct quotation of Hadith. On the other hand, the Ijtihadi process that we have today, it is appreciating the same texts in its literalistic fashion, face value fashion. And that's why we have this notion, cut the meat in mina, whether it gets rotten and rotted away or whether somebody consumes it, whether there's a needy person there or not, if you have to waste it, waste. And as a result, we are wasting tons Hundreds of thousands of carcasses. We are wasting them. Mountains of meat being buried. Saudis can't process it. Is that method that was valid at one point still valid today? Think about it carefully. Or is it that the conceptual Mahdi, which is a notion of forever progression of humanity, self-actualization with the growth of human nobility, that the rights of men and women have changed? It is no longer the case that the woman needs to beg a man for a divorce and then beg a mujtahid to grant her a divorce when the man refuses. Is it a case when a woman is earning more than a man and providing more than a man that she gets half the share of a man? Is the same interpretive method that was ordained at one point ordained as a method or was it ordained for it yielding accuracy in that context? If we say the same method was ordained as authority, then that method may become counterproductive after a century or two or three. Can you see that? I'll just give one little example. It is haram to incapacitate ourselves from performing Sharia duties. So it is haram in the strictest sense for me to leave a place and go to another place where I can't perform Sharia duties. If we were to stretch this, then I can't go and live in a northern region where there is no day or no night. Can you see that? If we stretch it, I can't become an astronaut and go to space because there's no rising sun or setting sun or no first new moon or no five times. Are you seeing how far it can go? So the answer is that yes, authority is given. But authority may not be given to a particular person or particular method. Authority is given to accuracy of appreciation of the want of God in line with the progressive human, human trend that is the true Mahdism that is dynamic and in, at work within the vein of humanity. We will leave it here and we will further examine it tomorrow. Imam Hussein in his story has a beloved companion, Habib ibn Mawahir. We find, switch of the lights, we find in the Maqatil that as the forces of Yazid mount in Karbala, Lady Zainab comes to Imam Hussein and says, do you not have any helpers? He said, and who will come and help me in this jungle Karbala? In this wilderness, Karbala, she said, your childhood friend, Habib, Imam breaks into a smile. He dispatches a letter to Habib. We hear this depiction from the Dakirin. There is a knock at the door in the late hours of night. Habib asks, who be at the door? Qasid of Hussein, the messenger of Hussein. Habib runs to the door takes the letter and kisses it, opens the letter and reads its content, O oh, Habib, you are a faqih, you are an alim. I am trapped in Karbala. Do not value your life above mine. Hasten to my assistance. Habib shows the content of this letter to his wife. She says, O oh, Habib, what do you decide? 
but who is there for you after I go? She said, Woe be unto you, O Habib. Shall the son of Muhammad and Ali die? And their daughters be taken as captive? And you worry about your own wife? Hasten, O Habib. Habib sends his slave to the borders of Kufa. He meets Hani, Muslim ibn Ausaja. He asks to Muslim, Muslim asks Habib, where are you going? He says to Hussein. He is trapped in Karbala. Muslim throws the hina that he has bought. He says, by God, I will cover this white beard with my own blood in the defense of my master Hussein. Habib comes to where his horse is and rides. Imam Hussein has prepared a few standards and he has distributed them. But he keeps a standard to himself. People are desirous of receiving that standard. Hussein does not give it to them. They see raised dust from the hooves of an oncoming horse. Hussein says, the bearer of the standard approaches us. As Habib comes close, Hussein smiles at him. And Habib says, oh Hussein, even though I have grown old, and my body has withered away. Yet when I look at you, youthful blood begins to run within my veins. There is commotion and joy. Zainab asks Fiza, why is there this joy? Hussein's childhood friend has come. Zainab sends salam. Habib tears and he says, oh Zain, Oh, for destitution. If only I had brought a force with me. Habib is fighting alongside Hussein, reading poetry and warning his enemies. Habib gets struck as he descends to the ground. Hussein runs to Habib. He takes Habib's head and he says, Oh, Habib. Shall you leave your friend? Hamid ibn Muslim says, The first time I saw expression of brokenness and hopelessness was when Hussein was bidding farewell to Habib. Habib breaks into a smile. Oh Hussein, this is your grandfather quenching me with the cup of kothar and saying, tell Hussein, O Hussein, hasten to me, for I can wait no longer. Allah la'anatullah al-qawmi al-zalimeen. Wa siya'alamu al-ladhina zalamu wa yamun qalabi yan qalibun. Raham Allah man qala al-Fatiha. Thank you, Sheikh. The first question is on the topic of supplication. The questioner asks, in view of the discussions of many supplications maybe not being as authentic as may have been considered, can you recommend any specific authentic supplications that have been narrated? So the problem with authenticity is that if we were to subject these supplications to the utmost scrutiny, Many will not stand the test. But if you want to look at supplications that seem to be from the Imam in their eloquency and their God-centric theme, well, Sahih Sajadiya, Dua Kumail, Dua Sabah, the great many parts of, till about the end of Dua Rafa of Hussein ibn Ali Salamu these are some of those applications that we find are really accurate in terms of their themes. Or the du'as of Imam Zainul Abidin for every day. These seem to be, in terms of their themes, very, very accurate and God-centric. Yeah. You stated that anybody who claims to have met the Imam shouldn't be trusted or it shouldn't be accepted. The questioner then asks, does this infer 
that there is no possibility of meeting the Imam? Or is it that if you do meet with him, then it must be kept private? No. When a person meets with the Imam, that does not constitute evidence for anybody else. Two, if we were to say, yes, this man is meeting with the Imam, then that can open a door to a lot of corruption. Because people can make all sorts of claims and all sorts of falsities may be introduced and all sorts of advantages may be taken. The person who sees the Imam and feel that they have, feels that they have seen the Imam, it should be confined to them themselves. They should not say it to anybody else. And two, how can they be sure that they have seen the Imam anyway? Now, when you talk about meeting with the Imam, then you get all these theories that we have in our books that he lives in Bermuda Triangle. Do you remember when we were growing up, it's all, it was all about Bermuda Triangle. And the, do you remember it, right? All the ships going missing and planes going missing. And, you know, thank God we didn't have aeroplanes. We would have just flown into it. And then he lives amongst us and he marries and he doesn't die and his wives die. But he carries on living and he has children. And that's why we have all of these people claiming that they are the children of the 12th Imam, right? We have some factions in Iraq saying that they are the children of the 12th Imam and they're representing the 12th Imam. It opens the door to all sorts of absurdities. And that's why the Imam himself said, anybody who says they've seen me, just flatly don't believe it. Yeah? Final question on the topic of the authority of the Mujtahid. This is in relation to the story that you gave yesterday and critique the narration of the child, the fetus being saved in the womb of the dead mother. And you stated, well, why does the Imam save one life and not all those in the Middle East? Now the questioner asserts here that the Imam is doing it through the Mujtahid. Just look at Ayatollah Sistani who has prevented a bloodbath in Iraq and defeated ISIS. So now, Ayatollah Sistani has come on to the scene in the last, may Allah prolong his life, 20 odd years, yes? Now, the Imam could have intervened and told them that there is something like ISIS brewing up prior to it happening. Can you see that? And then maybe far less people would have been killed. Two, if you ask Ayatollah Sistani, he will respond to you and say he has never seen the 12th Imam. Please, somebody go and ask him. That's what he said when you know, he was asked personally. And then he was asked uh, by a very dear friend of mine from Peterborough. He was asked that, well, what about all these amal that we do to see the 12th Imam? Ayatollah Sistani said none of them are authentic. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sheikh. Thank uh, you. Can I ask that we prepare for uh, Maghrib prayer? and Ziyarat will be recited after Salah. Thank you very much. Thank you.